Black holes are some of the most fascinating objects in the universe. They're called star eaters for a reason. Naturally, they've been portrayed in countless movies, documentaries, and YouTube videos. Now, I'm no physicist, so don't expect a deep dive into how black holes work or how they form. What I do know is how to code, though, and I've always been curious about how black holes are rendered. So, well, I think you know where this is going, right? Imagine you're in a submarine, deep beneath the ocean surface. So deep in fact that it's completely pitch black outside. How would you know how far you are from the ocean floor? Well, engineers solved this problem decades ago. The trick is to emit a high intensity sound wave, called a ping, that travels through the water. Eventually, the sound bounces off the seabed and returns to the submarine. By measuring how long it takes to come back, you can calculate exactly how far away the ocean floor is. Now, imagine you send out another ping. And this time, it comes back faster. You check your depth meter and you're not any deeper. So, you send out one more ping. And it returns even quicker. So, something's changed, you figure. Either you're moving towards something, or something's moving towards you. What if I told you that a similar technique can be used to render black holes? Let's say you want to know how far away you are from a specific point in space. In order to do so, you just need to subtract your position from that point's position. This works fine for just a point, but what if you want to know how far away you are from the surface of a square, or maybe some other geometry? Then you need something a bit more sophisticated. And that's where sine distance functions come into play. To understand sine distance functions, let's start with something simple. A circle centered around the origin. As you can see, some points fall outside the circle, some inside, and just a few land right on the edge. Now, say we pick one of these points, and we want to know how far it is from the circle's surface. Let's go step by step. First, think of the point's position as a vector. We can just measure the length of that vector, and that gives us the distance from the origin. Then subtract the circle's radius, and you're left with the distance to the surface. You'll notice that we get some negative values, which are points that are inside the circle whereas positive values are outside, thus the signed and sine distance functions. This is just one SDF, and people like Inigo Kiles have worked out a ton of them. Back to our starting scenario, we can calculate the distance to the circle surface. Now, if we were to have a rectangle, we can just plot a new SDF. And here's the best part. If we have multiple objects, we can define a new function, with both distances. And by simply taking the smallest one, we get the distance to the closest object. This might seem like a simple trick, but we can use it to define entire scenes made of multiple objects. Sign distance functions are the core ingredient of a rendering technique called ray marching. Here's how it works. We start by casting a ray in some direction. Using our SDF, we take a step forward exactly that far. Then, at that point, we sample the distance again, and repeat, marching a ray and sampling in every step. Notice that if the ray is heading toward an object, the SDF will at some point return either zero or a very small value. That's how we know we've hit something. But if the ray points into empty space, the distances will get larger and larger with every step, meaning there's nothing there. If we now take a spin, we can have a much more precise idea of the scene surrounding us. By casting one ray per pixel and calculating how close each one gets to an object, we can have this cool glowing outline. With a similar trick like this, we can add some color to the scene. And by calculating some normals and adding a light, we get some nice shadows. Now, since this video is about black holes, let me add a more fitting background. As you can see, remarching is surprisingly simple, yet it's powerful enough to render incredible visuals, from infinite repeating structures to very intricate fractals. But how can we use it to render something as a black hole? Well, we're actually pretty close. Pay attention. Let's cast a new ray, but this time we'll use fixed length steps, meaning all steps will be equal in size. Normally a ray travels in a straight line, as its direction stays constant throughout. But near a black hole, things change. 
See, black holes are so massive that lights get bent and distorted near them. That's why they have this signature halo around. This effect is called gravitational lensing. Back to a ray, if instead of keeping the ray's direction fixed, we update it at every step, bending it based on the black hole's gravity, suddenly the ray curves inward, pulled towards the black hole. This distortion is so strong that strange things start to happen as we get closer. For example, we can see objects that are actually behind the black hole. Get closer and we can even see ourselves reflected. Get even closer and we get to the photosphere, where light orbits the black hole sometimes for several loops before either escaping or getting swallowed. Any closer and we fall into the event horizon, where not even light can escape. That's why a black hole is, well, black. So, after all of this explanation, I think it's time to enjoy some nice visuals. So far we've seen how to simulate the distortion that a black hole produces on light. But if you've watched Interstellar or some other images, you might have noticed something missing in our render. This weird looking halo surrounding it. This glowing structure is called the accretion disk. Some black holes, especially really big ones, have such intense gravitational pulls that matter gathers around them. This matter, instead of falling straight in, starts spiraling down like water down a drain. As the material gets closer and closer, friction and gravitational forces heat it up to extreme temperatures. Rendering this accretion disk turned out to be a much more challenging task than I expected. And after a very sloppy first attempt, I scrapped everything and took a different approach, simulating it as a cloud. See, this accretion disk is mostly made out of gas and dust, just like clouds here on Earth, but like a gazillion times hotter. And luckily for us, ray marching happens to be the go-to technique for rendering clouds. Let me show you how I did it. Once again, we cast one of our rays. But this time, when it hits the object that represents our cloud, we don't stop. We keep marching, taking fixed steps just like before. As the ray travels to the cloud, it gets gradually blocked more and more, depending on the cloud's density. If it's pretty thin, the ray will pass almost untouched. But if it's denser, it fades out quickly, until eventually it won't go any further. To determine how much of our ray is being blocked at each step, we use Beer's law, which, given the cloud's density and our step size, calculates the transmittance, which is the fraction of our ray that passes onto the next step. We then accumulate this absorption step by step along the ray's path. If we apply this method across an object and set a proper step size, we get a nice translucent looking cloud. A higher density makes it appear more opaque and a lower one makes it more see-through. But there's a problem. If we add a light source, well, nothing changes. Right now we're calculating how the cloud blocks our view, not how light actually interacts with the cloud itself. So even if we put a light directly across the cloud, it doesn't glow or scatter or anything. Let's go back to the drawing board. As light gets emitted and passes through the cloud, it doesn't just go through. Light will scatter, losing intensity until it gets completely blocked. This creates brighter and darker regions inside the cloud. How can we estimate how much light reaches each point in the cloud? The solution is pretty simple. When we introduce a light to the scene, we can just cast another ray. This second ray starts at our current sample point and heads toward the light. Just like before, we take fixed steps, applying Beer's law to know how much this light gets dimmed. And we do this for every step. After applying this, you'll see that the cloud has turned dark. But when we get the light closer, some parts will get more illuminated than others. At this point, we're almost done. We got only two more important steps to go. First, when the light hits the cloud, we've been assuming it scatters evenly in all directions. But light tends to scatter more forward than backward. To account for this, we use something called a phase function, like the Henier-Grinstein model. 
This will give our clouds that nice soft silver lining effect. And lastly, our cloud looks super uniform. Until now we've assumed that the density is equal at all points, where in reality, clouds are pretty uneven. We can fix this by making density depend on some purling noise. Now, there will be parts that are super dense and parts that are basically empty. And with that, we finally have some pretty realistic looking clouds. They are super inefficient though, and not perfect by any means. But still, I think they look pretty good. With our volumetric clouds ready, all that's left is to take our black hole, make a cloud disk around it, add some lighting, swirling, and a bit of a spin. And before I show you the final result, please remember to subscribe and like the video. Your support is super helpful. And now just sit back and enjoy the view. Thanks for watching.